Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to NPTEL the national program on technology enhanced learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. Today is the last lecture in our 40 lecture series on cultural studies. It has indeed been a most wonderful journey for me. I must say today that in the course of recording these lectures, I too have, have learned a lot um, not only about cultural studies, but also about, um, about virtual classes, about the importance of long distance learning and teaching. And I welcome you heartily to this last lecture of the series, which is entitled Summing Up. Since this is a lecture where we sum up what we have learned so far, um, we are not today going to have any question answer session in this lecture, uh, nor uh, are we going to mention the, the key source texts for the key source texts of each lecture. You may go back to the individual lectures. However, we will of course have the uh, you know a brief recap of what we did in the last lecture. The last lecture you will recall was devoted to a critique of cultural studies. We called it the or called it critiquing cultural studies, and we saw that critique involves both criticism, that is saying, uh, that is scrutinizing, uh, you know, any domain, any area, any object, any form, right? Uh, in a bit to show some of its, uh, you know, uh, some of the lacunae or gaps in those areas and it also involves you know um, an inquiry into the basic premises okay, and axioms inhering or inherent in any field of study. Right? So, with that we first talked about you know some of the um, lacunae gaps or some of uh, the criticisms that have been levied over the years since cultural studies began as a discipline and we found let us look at this slide here we found that some of the adjectives and phrases that have been used to describe and crit criticize cultural studies have been these many have found cultural studies too trendy okay uh, an academic fashion it has found it to be not truly scholarly and it has also said go it has gone so far as to say that there is no real research in cultural studies and it is not a discipline proper. We then towards the end of uh, you know the last lecture also defended cultural studies right by saying that cultural studies never claimed to be a discipline proper as we saw it was so interdisciplinary in nature um, and it had to be interdisciplinary in nature because all the disciplines really fall and their uh, subject matter fall under culture, under the great rubric of culture, right. Uh, we also went on to defend cultural studies by saying that um, some of the sort of, some of the critiques and the criticism came from those who found the anti-positivist impulse of cultural studies difficult to swallow and they, these are, uh, you know, uh, these are voices really that perhaps could not accept, let us look at this slide here, the uncertainty and provisionality of knowledge that was uh, argued by cultural studies. The discursive, okay, the discursive nature of cultural studies, we saw that cultural studies was a way of speaking. Uh, usually alternative discourses, alternative ways of description and signification were encouraged okay? and indeterminacy be becomes a virtue in cultural studies. Okay? Why as we saw um, to, to be too deterministic 
Okay. Again led us to the pitfalls of positivism, where there was no self reflexiveness and where there was no understanding of the fact that knowledge was created by human beings with particular cognitive structures. Right? And also finally, over determination as we find found many want to have well delineated, well identified uh, identifiable causes to phenomena and over determination may not go down well with, with uh, some critics. Right? Any, anyhow, uh, let us now um, after having done this brief recap, go on to sum up what we have learnt in our lectures. Okay. Do you recall this important question which was posed in lecture 1 okay, and where I say asked, have you ever asked yourselves, why do we live the kind of lives that we live? Okay. This question we found was immensely important because we you know, if we do not make an inquiry into why we do things, why we like certain things, okay, why we do not like certain things, why we have certain kinds of social arrangements, cultural practices, right? Why is there inequality in this world? Why is there racism in this world? Why is there ethnic strife in this world? Okay, what is identity? What is subjectivity? Uh, that make us, right? That define us. Then we are leading a life without any thinking, really. Okay. So we said it's important for us to pose this question: Why are we living the kind of lives that we live? And then, please look at this slide. We said that there are ways of framing this question in cultural studies, and one of the ways is this: that in cultural studies, this question may be framed as: How are we produced as subjects? Okay, so, we call a person in cultural studies, we do not call a person a person, we call um, a person a subject, a subject who feels, okay, a subject who is an agent, a su subject who has an inner life and an outer identity and a subject who holds certain values to be dear and those to himself or herself and those values go on to um, finally, you know, make that person or take decisions or and, and you know um, undertake certain actions. right? So, this is we found uh, and I, I have to reiterate this is that this is a very important question, okay? how are we produced as subjects. Then we saw uh, you know uh, through Richard Johnson in his essay, what is cultural studies anyway, we found that this is how he talks about the domain of cultural studies. He says that the ultimate, I'm quoting from him, the ultimate object of cultural studies is not the text, but the social life of subjective forms at each moment of their circulation, including their textual embodiments. Okay? So, again, if you look at uh, go back to uh, the lecture before this. In fact, when you look, if you go at, look at the critique of cultural studies, we have we saw there that textualism, or or what many feel, uh, you know, a lot uh, too much emphasis on texts and the textuality and the discursive nature of cultural practices was one of um, you know one of the criticisms levied on cultural studies. Okay? But Johnson here defends cultural studies by saying that it is not the text okay, which is sacrosanct, it is not the text uh, you know, which is the central focus in cultural studies. He goes on to say that it is the social life okay, of the text, it is a social life of subjective forms and by subjective forms, why are we calling forms subjective? We are terming um, you know, uh, we are terming these forms subjective because after all they are produced by human beings right? at particular moments uh, in history, uh, in particular spaces and times. Okay? So, in that case, the, the, we saw that objectivity is something that we cannot accept at least as it is uh, you know, nothing called ob absolute objectivity. Okay? Every domain of knowledge including including the sciences okay cannot be completely object objective as long as it is human beings who are creating them okay so what we look at is not the text but this the very importantly the social life okay of a 
text and how it is circulated, how it is produced, how it is distributed and how ultimately it is consumed. Secondly, what are the texts that are in circulation in the first place and we found that the reason why certain texts are in circulation in the first place in lieu of others is a matter of power and of ideology. Fine. Then we talked about a very important essay if you remember in the first lecture entitled Cultural Studies, Two Paradigms and we, found, we know by now that Stuart Hall is one of the most important theorists who ha you have to read if you have to understand cultural studies. Um, and Stuart Hall in this essay uh, took us back to the beginning of cultural studies and he says that cultural studies has a definite legacy in the sense that um, we have to point to three scholars okay, uh, who really began this alternative way of looking at culture and these are Raymond Williams, Richard Hoggard and E. P. Thompson and their um, books respectively which are important in the genealogy of cultural studies are culture and society, uses of literacy and the making of the English working class. These uh, you know these books and some of the other works that were you know um, uh, around in circulation so to speak in that time says Stuart Hall showed culture as ordinary right. So, we know that in our in our series we are considering culture in specific ways A is that culture is ordinary, culture is not to do with what we understand as high culture or classical music or dance forms or the theatre etcetera. Culture is everyday, everyday practices, everyday cultural forms is one. This definition or this description or if you, if you want to say the label of culture as ordinary was importantly given to us by um, Raymond Williams. right? Then we saw that culture is a way of life, right? It's a way of life of, you know, of people, and we, had, we, the, the, the onus in cultural studies is also to investigate the way of life, why we have certain ways of life and not others. Third, culture is seen as, from this point onward, as democratized. Okay, that is the culture of the people, right? And with democratization comes in a very important. Um, area which was not really hitherto seen as uh, something worthy maybe of study and it was the bringing in of, if I may write this here, the bringing in of the study of popular culture into the academic, mainstream academic domain and again Richard uh, Hogart and uh, Raymond Williams were instrumental in uh, you know demanding and establishing the you know the study of popular culture in in academia. Finally, we also found that culture is understood as meaning creation, the generation of meaning, the circulation of meaning is also an important part of cultural studies. Here mainly it is the post-structuralist turn and the semiological turn okay, which many say is uh, you know a later addition okay, to the usually materialist school that was inaugurated by uh, Richard William, uh, sorry Richard Hoggart and Raymond Williams. So, then we also saw that a, way, a few of the ways in which culture is seen in cultural studies is culture is a tool right with which we you know construct our lives right. Culture is like a language, culture is about the artifacts and forms that we produce and create, culture is a way of life and culture is to do very importantly with the workings of power. So, essentially speaking in our course if you look back you will realize that these are more or less you know the important points around which the courses are really revolving ok, culture as a tool, culture as a language, culture as artifacts, culture as a way of life and culture as power. Then uh, Chris Barker has been with us all this while and uh, his book as I had mentioned earlier cultural um, studies theory and practice is our seminal book or you would say if you if we are to uh, you know uh, identify one book which may remain with us as our textbook in this course okay has been Chris Barker's 
cultural studies, theory and practice. We also had other books by Chris Barker, for instance, importantly, the Sage Dictionary of Cultural Studies served us immensely well um, in understanding uh, concepts, okay, and also making sense of cultural studies was another book by Chris Barker. And uh, let's again recall what Barker had uh, said in uh, his works that I'm quoting from him, cultural studies is not only interdisciplinary, but post-disciplinary in the sense that there is a willing blurring of boundaries between itself and other subjects. Okay? Uh, cultural studies has been celebrated uh, by uh, its proponents as uh, one of and perhaps the most interdisciplinary field in the, the humanities and social sciences. Okay? And its detractors have found it unmanageable, has, have found the interdisciplinarity you know, um, uh, you know, too shifting and uh, there is, they, found, they have found too many borrowings from uh, cultures uh, from different disciplines. So, uh, Barker therefore calls it a post, uh, sorry, post disciplinary sorry for the spelling error, post-disciplinary uh, domain in the sense that this blurring of the boundaries between say anthropology and cultural studies, uh, literature and cultural studies, sociology and cultural studies, political economy and cultural studies, okay, kindred domains. It is not that you know the borrowings are done because you can't help it. There is in fact a willing breaking down of boundaries between itself and, and uh, these kindred domains. Then Barker also said that there is no claim to any originality here. Many who remember in the last lecture we saw that the fact that it is not a discipline proper is one of the criticisms of cultural studies, right? We uh, Barker on the other hand says that it is uh, cultural studies, it is defined in fact, okay, by it is identified by the fact that it does not want to be a discipline, right? It is interdisciplinary nature is its very nature, right? So, there is no point saying that this is not a discipline proper and there are no margins, no boundaries. This is the whole enterprise of cultural studies, the methodology of cultural studies. So, there is no, what, what is, um, you know, focus on rather than, you know, maintaining the disciplinary boundaries, what is focused here? are the identification of new patterns and ways of seeing. Remember, we had said that re-describing, re-signification as a political tool okay, is the methodology of cultural studies okay? and to see newer patterns and to identify new patterns so that habitual ways of thinking, habitual ways of um, you know, uh, description and definition that, that naturalize some ways of seeing okay, in some texts so, so that these are broken. Okay? Uh, that is why we have to find out new patterns and new connections and new ways of seeing. And we also uh, recall that the political um, you know, aspect of cultural studies is, is uh, you know, up, you know, its most important aspect uh, in the sense that this is the aspect that uh, distinguishes it from all other domains. It is not to say that domains like anthropology, sociology, literary theory do not you know, ha, you know, do not have as its um, one of its one of their aims the uh, reveal, you know, the revealing of uh, of power and structures of power. But uh, perhaps no other discipline has as its main goal, okay, the um, the, the the revealing of the workings of power and the betterment of. Uh, life and the you know the, the the reducing of inequality etc. Okay, so this is what Barker had told us, and we found this in the beginning of our lectures. Then uh, Barker says that one of the ways by which we may highlight the differences is by rephrasing the question. Okay, what is cultural studies? And then we found very importantly that we insert you know if somebody asks us what is cultural studies, then we do not really have an answer and that is why many have been able to, uh, to kind of target cultural studies and, say, and to say that this is too nebulous an area, it is too restless an area. Okay? Um, you know, some area, it is an area you go into and you just flit into it and you can come out of it okay? because it does not demand uh, any methodological rigor in it. But there is a different kind of rigor that is demanded by cultural studies and one, one that requires a certain amount of courage in us in the sense that instead as Barker says of asking um, 
what is cultural studies, we are to ask how do we talk about cultural studies. Okay, so it um, it celebrates a plethora or multiplicity of definitions of meanings. Okay, in how many different ways can you talk about cultural studies? Then, uh, what are the purposes of cultural studies? Right. What are the aims? Why do cultural studies in the first place? Very few disciplines, I think, would you know have this as one of the questions at the forefront, right? Why uh, you know what are the purposes of a discipline? What are the purposes uh, of doing cultural studies, right? And thirdly, what are the practices of cultural studies, right? Um, what does cultural studies? Um, oh, sorry. Where are the practices of cultural studies? I'm very sorry. Where are the practices of cultural studies located? Okay. Remember, we devoted a whole, um, a whole uh, module, module uh, three, I think it was, on sites of cultural studies, where we, uh, where we tried to see, where you know. Um, where culture happens, where these practices are located for the body for instance was a site for us, so also was consumption and spa even space and time. Fine. So, oh, really after the introductory lectures, you know what did we uh, go to, what did we talk about? If you remember we said that before going into cultural studies, um, you know the simio, we were going to talking about the theories and the key concepts etcetera, right. We said that we are going to look at what science has to tell us about culture and why we did this was because um, one of the increasing uh, you know criti criticisms of cultural studies especially in recent times as Barker has also mentioned uh, is that um, cultural studies hitherto had uh, not been able to show a certain rigor that you know a training that comes with studying science. And secondly, some of the important contributions that science had to give us particularly biology, okay. Because we are also biological beings apart from being cultural beings, if at all we can make a difference between biology and culture and we saw that we should not make a difference. Anyhow, we saw that evolutionary psychology in understanding why we have or why we live you know the kind of lives that we live, one of the reasons. Uh, we can find in our evolutionary past, in our evolutionary history and for instance why we uh, you know have certain deep structures in us, why we have certain you know fears, why we have certain emotions which and the proof of this is that you know uh, these are common across uh, you know people in all communities. So, therefore, in this slide let us look at the slide we found uh, in uh, I think the third lecture that um, things like or propensities like predator, avoidance, habitat selection, mate selection, coalition, parental investment and reciprocal altruism. These are part of us through our evolutionary lineage and these are still in us, right. So, this is what um, you know science tells us, this is what the study of evolution and particularly evolutionary psychology has given us. These need to be incorporated, more research needs to be done in the interface okay, between science particularly biology and uh, the humanities, because uh, even though we have queried science, okay, we also have said that science works. Right, the findings from science may, may still be provisional no doubt, but we find that science works better than any other discipline okay, as a knowledge a domain of knowledge. Okay. So, uh, that is why we devoted three or four lectures to the scientific understanding of culture and we then also after talking about evolutionary psychology, its five principles you will recall okay, and um, uh, talking about uh, we came to the uh, the idea of memes as given to us by Richard Dawkins and we found in I think our sixth lecture okay, that the meme is the unit of cultural transmission or of imitation and that it is a noun like the gene and the analogy was made by Dawkins uh, it was shown by Richard Dawkins in his chapter on memetics okay, between the gene and the meme and we talked about if you remember meme complexes, we talked about the god meme and uh, you, you know we tried to understand how these basic units of culture right uh, transmitted themselves from brain to brain is also, also talked about you know the uh, characteristics that, that these cultural units 
uh, elementary cultural units should have if they were to survive at all. And we saw cult culture also in terms of evolution. So, we had cultural evolution on the one hand and genetic evolution on the other hand. So, this was uh, you know by now this lecture we came to the end of three or four lectures that were devoted to the scientific understanding of culture. Then we went on to really what we call the crux of our um, uh, you know uh, lectures and we talked about theory and we also said that there was no need to be afraid of theory, there was no need, theory is a way of speaking okay, using certain terminologies you have if you are not scared of theoretical physics then why should you be scared of theory in cultural studies. We saw theory as an organized set of ideas an explanatory framework, a position that we take, a comprehensive explanation, a general idea or a proposition. Okay. This was uh, um, in a show, this was in a bit to show the scope of theory and what we could do and of course, if you uh, talk about anything, you cannot really have a proper discourse without having a framework, an explanatory framework or an organized set of ideas and that is why we talked about the importance of doing theory in cultural studies. Right. Um, we also saw that theory is important because theory shows the workings of ideology and we saw ideology, we defined ideology which was one of the key concepts okay, okay, in, uh, in our course, uh, the, the second module was devoted to key concepts and we found that ideology could be also alternatively called a worldview. Okay, um, a way of seeing the world, ideas as a doctrine, as maps of meaning and as consciousness. Then um, we took, we went to our first, into our first uh, you know theoretical school and I had said that there were several theoretical schools and because of paucity of time, we could not go into all of them, but uh, three important ones that were uh, identified at least by Chris Barker in his work were structuralism, Marxism and uh, and post structuralism okay so we looked first at structuralism and we saw that um, structuralism or the structuralist understanding of a culture was deeply related or uh, borrowed heavily from structuralist linguistics as was given to us by Saussure by the study of semiotics or meaning okay and we found that culture in was found to be like a language, okay, was like a semiological system where as you find in the slide here, culture is a system of relations like words operate and take on their meaning in a system of relations. Okay. Uh, 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 culture also takes on meaning uh, by difference, by relation in among units in a system of relations. So, a structuralist understanding of culture we found is concerned with the systems of relations of an underlying structure usually language and the grammar that makes meaning possible. So, even cultural arrangements were seen as grammatical as laid out uh, like a language. We also um, then we looked at um, at Marxism, in fact we devoted two lectures to Marxism and uh, we saw that uh, you know uh, the contribution of Karl Marx and of Frederick Eng Engels uh, is seminal to an understanding of culture. We talked about um, if you recall we talked about the base and the superstructure and how uh, you know the ruling ideas of each age okay were actually the ideas of the the ideas of the ruling class and we talked about um, how marx had shown that you know um, every epoch is characterized by a system of exploitation it uh, the you know the forms are different from epoch to epoch but you know the nature of the exploitation continues in the sense that there are those who have uh, you know control over the means of production okay and there are those who are always dominated and who um, are exploited in the sense that their labor uh, is not adequately uh, compensated for in the sense that they, they are not allowed to share in the profit that arises from labor. We also saw in very importantly that uh, history moves moves on in a dialectical process which Hegel called the thesis, antithesis and the synthesis. And according to Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, okay, 
uh, whenever there is um, you know whenever the forces of production okay whenever the forces of production come into conflict with the existing relations of production then society enters a new mode of production there is a revolution and society enters a new mode of production we also saw uh, that you know the history of mankind may be seen as a struggle okay a struggle among classes and be and uh, between two you know two two major classes okay which as we saw were took different forms in diff different um, times for instance beginning with ancient slavery uh, we find this the masters and the slaves in feudalism we find the um, serfs I'm sorry the uh, the the lord the overlord and the tenants or the serfs and uh, in um, in bourgeois soci society in capitalism that is we found that there were the those who controlled um, capital the bourgeois class and those who worked or sold their labor okay that is a proletariat and we also saw that these continued in the form of you know other phases like um, uh, like um, neoliberalism or imperialism and also we found that Marxism believed that eventually there would be a classless society with the revolution of the proletariat. Okay? Marxism we also understood was one of the uh, one of the uh, one of uh, you know the four forebearers so to speak of cultural studies in the sense that even today okay, uh, the legacy of cultural studies is first always uh, Marxism okay, is uh, always you know materialism as we found in the work of Richard Hogarth and Raymond Williams and then uh, we talked about post structuralism right, where we uh, where we found that it carried on it was you know uh, um, it carried on the argument given by Saussure about about the signifier and the signified, but it added a very important element in the sense that it saw the you know the, no one signified, okay? It saw a series of potential signifieds, and um, it also uh, pointed out through scholars like you know philosophers like Derrida about what he called you know the metaphysics of presence in uh, western culture and um, how you know uh, there is always uh, in the binary opposites culture is seen through binary oppositions of say good and bad dark and light uh, light and dark um, um, culture or nature and culture etc and that these binaries needed to be dismantled okay we if we have to understand culture and on all its complexity right then we moved on to um, the next module, the second module was devoted to key concepts and we said that without key concepts which are the tools okay, of cultural studies, tools that give rise to the methodology or, or of doing cultural studies, we cannot really be, you know, continue to talk about cultural studies. Okay. We have to understand what are the concepts and ideas, what are you know, uh, what, is it, what are the words that that make the terminology and uh, you know the terminological tool if you will of cultural studies and we found that identity, subjectivity, um, uh, representation, discourse, power, these were among others some of the key, key terms and concepts in cultural studies. For instance, um, we saw um, this word called representation and we devoted two uh, lectures to representation and we saw through Chris Barker in his Sage Dictionary of Cultural Studies that representation is uh, an act of symbolism, okay, all right, but in cultural studies representation does not simply reflect in symbolic form things, okay. It does not involve correspondence between signs and objects, but creates very importantly the representational effect of things, okay. So, in this whole process of representing something, in talking about things, okay. For instance, the representation of women, uh, for instance, as we saw in the media, right, in advertisements, right. Um, it is not not everything that is there to be represented about. It is not a true representation, a proper or whole total representation uh, of what. Uh, of what a woman is. It is an effect that is created and that is guided by certain 
um, uh, you know, uh, certain goals in mind. Okay, so also not only in advertising, we find that representation processes are deeply imbued by issues of power and politics. Okay, why why one representation works and another doesn't is a matter of um, ideology, is a matter of ruling ideas of the ruling class, as Marx would have it. Then we talked about you know uh, discourses and we. Uh, discourse and we, we saw that discourse was an immensely important term, a key term in cultural studies, uh, because discourse is you know every discourse is a way of talking about something. For instance, we saw you know uh, the idea you know the uh, man for instance, man as um, an object of study is defined in different ways. Uh, for instance, medical sciences, sciences would have a way of describing what man is. Okay? We talk about man uh, in, in terms of um, biology, in terms of uh, diseases, in terms of what is health for instance. Okay? On the other hand, religion would talk about man in a totally different uh, sense. Okay? And literature would again talk about man and his passions and his emotions right so all these ways are discourses all these ways are ways of talking and describing what man is i'm only giving we only uh, talked about the idea of man but everything for instance okay that are cultural that are uh, cultural practices cultural products everything uh, is defined in different ways and that is why cultural studies holds that there is you know no one way no one legitimate way of describing anything right all uh, all descriptions are a descriptions with a purpose are uh, also as many would say are descriptions with uh, which which uh, you know uh, sort of want to show themselves as the best way or the right way of describing something. So, we saw that discourses are therefore, may be defined as objects, uh, as structured systems, discourses definitely are also texts and they are ideological systems. Now, we understand why discourses are ideological, because they uh, every discourse wishes to show that this is you know uh, this is the best way to describe itself or describe an object. Then we also saw that culture itself, okay, um, if we define culture as maps of meaning, we say that these maps of meanings are always shifting right? and should be so, right? because we, we in cultural studies accept the fact that these maps of meaning or these meanings acquire a certain stability, that the stability is an illusion really. Why? Because these are temporary stabilizations. Okay? Temporary stability is um, um, achieved through discursive practices and whenever uh, we move from discourse to discourse, this stability is broken and any object okay, like as we saw man for instance, begins on begins to take on different hues and colors and descriptions as we move A from discourse to discourse and also within a discourse as we move through time okay, as the discourse changes. And we saw that Michel Foucault, the French philosopher is one of the most important persons in this. Whenever we talk about other uh, concepts like power, um, like discourse, then Foucault is um, the one who has given us or who has really thrown up in so many uh, uh, areas and particularly the nexus between power and knowledge and power and discourse is what we got through Michel Foucault. Then we also gender came in, we had two, uh, we devoted two lectures to gender and uh, we said that we are not going to talk only about feminism, we are going to talk about the construction of gender and the identity that comes in, in the construction of gender and we found that gender uh, today is an, you know not, not uh, understood in the traditional way of understanding gender is something you know different from sex and that sex was biological essential uh, you know a sexual identity and that gender was you know a discursive or con constructed term or a social term we found that both sex and gender and uh, are descriptive terms are matters of discourse now this is not again to deny the materiality the reality of the body but beyond that even as you go on to describe sexual identity you are using words you are using discourses so in that sense we have the idea of the illusion of gender as given to us by uh, judith uh, butler one of the staunch proponents uh, in queer theory and 
you know, in post feminism and Butler says that the effect of gender must be understood as the mundane ways in which bodily gestures, movements and styles of various kinds constitute the illusion of an abiding gendered self. This is very important. Okay, if you think that you have an abiding a fixed gendered identity, then that is only an illusion. Okay? And therefore, we found that there was a critique of traditional feminism, uh, you know, in in uh, you know uh, in newer ways of looking at gender as a key concept in cultural studies. Then we uh, um, you know um, we moved on to the next module which was called sites of cultural studies and that said a while ago you know sites means where is cultural where are cultural studies located or where does cultural hap culture happen right and one of the first topics that we took uh, or we talked about was body and many uh, before this probably many of us thought that the body was just a given okay it was only of flesh and blood but we found that body was also a text Right, body is also a matter of discourse, and while talking about body, among other things, we saw that Chris Barker talks gives us the, this idea of body work. Okay, uh, that remember identity and subjectivity are the two most important, uh, you know, elementary terms in cultural studies, and we saw that identity. Uh, if you make a very uh, you know kind of elementary distinction i know this much more than this but I, subjectivity is your inner life as you understand what does it feel to be me okay whereas identity is understood as the label uh, that is given to you uh, by a community by a society by culture okay and uh, in we found that studies of you know sites hinge around these areas of identity subjectivity power representation, gender, etcetera, right. So, Chris Barker while talking about the body gives us this important concept of body work and he says that uh, you know our identities and subjectivities are tied to the work we do on the body. You know we, we dress up the body, we, we have a you know have we have gestures, we have certain ways of being in the body okay and body work includes therefore regimes of diet, it includes fashion, it in includes cosmetic surgery, exercise, health promotion strategies and even organ transplants right. This is a work that we do on the body and once we do these work on the body, the body becomes a site of cultural practice. The body does not re simply remain something only of flesh and blood to be studied by biology, the body becomes a cultural affair. Then we talked about time, uh, we talked about space and time really and we found uh, we, we brought in, in uh, Zeman and Kaposi and wherein uh, let me quote from you know. Uh, Quote from their work, cultural studies which deal with time are interested in understanding the uses to which narratives of time have been put. Now, uh, we saw that you know, uh, of course, time is uh, one of the most important aspects of physics, but we saw that while physics may try to understand the nature of time, we in cultural studies are not you know interested in understanding the nature of time, we are under uh, you know, we are interested in trying to see how. Um, time has been put, our understandings of time have been put to use, have been put to uh, use by power okay, through representation. Uh, for instance, we saw uh, that in, in uh, saying that some nations are you know belated, are late in development, right. So, we have uh, you know an act of power here because we are defining some, some nations countries as underdeveloped only because they are in a sort of you know seen as being in a sort of time lag as, as far as development or mainstream development is concerned in the developed so called developed countries right. Space was uh, another site and we saw that space is not simply topographical or geographical, space uh, is, or is social construction importantly because space is related to work, family, leisure, consumption and privacy. Then of course, language uh, is also a site and we saw that language is a site in a different way because language is both a site and it is constitutive of discourse, constitutive of cultural studies and we saw language as the you know if cultural studies 
uh, one of the main tasks of cultural studies is the inquiry into meaning generation. The language is a means and medium of meaning generation. And we saw through Richard Rorty, the philosopher, that culture therefore can be seen as a language, culture can be seen as a conversation. And he also points to the primacy of language as far as talking about culture and cultural products is concerned. There is no other way in which we can do it and that is why language is both a site and uh, you know, um, uh, constitutive element of culture. Then we talked about ethnicity, race and nation and we uh, went on to say that ethnicity was about sharing, sharing norms, values, cultural practices, blood ties and homeland. And uh, we talk about nation and we said we made a difference, we, made, we distinguished between nation and national identity where, uh, and we said the nation was uh, more than just you know um, more than uh, geography and boundaries and you know and, and um, uh, maps nature uh, sorry a nation is also as was shown to us by Benedict Anderson in his book Imagined Communities, nature uh, sorry I am very sorry, a nation is an imagined community and national identity was a matter of the narrative of a narrative of shared origins, images, symbols and rituals. Therefore, nation is also discursive right, Na nation is what gives us our these imagined communities are formed by these shared symbols which give us our identity and subjectivity as you know members of a certain nation. Then uh, we talked towards the end of uh, module uh, you know 3 we talked about consumption in fact we devoted 2 lectures to consumption because uh, we are also consuming agents ok. And we consume not we, it is not that we go only go and buy things and con consume food etcetera we also consume ideas. Okay, we consume media uh, products, media forms for instance, we, co we consume cultural artifacts right. So, consumption is a very important site because that is where again culture happens, cultural practices happen and we saw that though consumption was studied in sociology and perhaps anthropology, the cultural turn in in uh, consumption studies brought in many other aspects for instance it was an int multidisciplinary approach and it was not only about utility it's, it was a post utilitarian approach and it focused on semiotic systems right in, in the meanings in inherent in consumption and the uses on meanings of good and therefore it was related we saw to postmodernism and especially the experience of consumption. Culture studies talks about the aesthetics and the experience of consumption and the emotional aspects of consumption right which forms only a part really of the traditional way of looking at consumption or studying consumption. Then one lecture was devoted in consumption to eating out the restaurant experience and we saw through scholars like Finkelstein etcetera that uh, you know rest the, the restaurant uh, the, the, pro the whole process of eating out was not some simply to do with gratification ok. It is we found that if even though we felt that these are our decisions to eat you know the decision to eat out or that we felt empowered as uh, you know uh, consumers uh, when we go and eat out but on the other hand. Uh, there is also a package that was already kind of you know created and made ready for us and this whole uh, as the scholars have pointed out this whole identity construction etcetera that we feel we are you know this feeling of being an agent in the consumption process was actually a simulated experience right. For instance the restaurant experience um, you know is a total consumption package that is pre kind of package for you. and. Um, you know uh, including themed restaurant restaurants and this whole experience uh, of the restaurant experience was also a constructed one. So, again if the consumer felt that he or she was constructing meaning and on the other hand eating out uh, you know um, studies show us that it is already you know present you know the we only uh, this it is a whole it is it is an illusion when we think that as consumers we are constructing our identity. Then we also found that there was a new orientation in the higher classes and we called it cultural omnivorousness that is variety uh, you know valuing variety for its own sake. This also was in distinction to or it, it is distinguishable from earlier you know uh, status uh, oriented 
consumption practices, uh, distinction oriented consumption practices. Okay, today we also find people willingly going in for different, um, uh, different consumption experiences in order to, you know, uh, in order to even make a claim of being culturally sophisticated through a variety of experiences. Then finally, in the, in, in the last uh, lecture in module 3, we found that biosemiotics I mean, this, you know, is an important, again biology is a site. Um, many would think, well, how is biology a site for cultural studies and we found that cultural studies has shown us okay, that even in even life. Okay, may be seen as a system of signs and codes. Okay, if you look at organisms carefully, you will find that organisms also produce signs and interpret signs and we on the on again, we interpret those signs uh, according to our own um, you know scientific training and our own technology. Right? So, the in, ta in fact, many would many even want to say that the, the universe itself is and is a system of codes, uh, which we have not been able to decipher and decode in its entirety. Right? So, the, uniform, uh, the, the, the universe and our planet with all its biological forms okay, are also you know in a sort of uh, what we may call a semiosphere, okay, giving out meanings, communicating with codes and uh, decoding, encoding and decoding meanings. Then we uh, moved on to the last module, the last module was entitled culture industries, cultural forms and we first began by talking about the culture industry and we our main text there was culture industry by Theodor Adorno and uh, Max Horkheimer from the uh, you know the Frankfurt school and um, uh, you know they made this important point that mass culture okay sort of look at the slide here please infects everything with sameness standardization regulation and deception okay uh, whereas you know if we thought that we as consumers of mass culture right uh, we are making the meanings adorno and horkheimer said importantly that consume mass con mass culture was uh, you know so uniform right and was so in you know in sort of infested with if I may use the word sameness and, and standardization and you know these were also regulated right that ultimately we should not we may even claim that as consumers we have off mass culture we have been sort of deceived because there is in fact in fact uh, you know um, a standardization that uh, ultimately becomes a repetition and again from the point of view of power becomes you know sort of a naturalizing of these standardized goods. Then we talked about the commodity as you know the, um, the equivalent of the molecule really in, in culture studies or in the equivalent uh, as you find in biology and Barker said Chris Barker on meanings in commodities, he pointed out to an important important you know important issue here which he found in that lecture was that uh, you know commodities when they are designed and uh, produced the design and production processes are modified and new meanings are created through new representation processes. So, it is not that uh, you know as uh, we found in Adorno and Horkheimer's arguments we found that there was a repetition there was standardization sameness. Barker says that well even commodities undergo change through the changes in design and production which are modified and they create new meanings right. And also the customer feedback, consumer feedback also uh, propels the creation of new design. So, it is not so static it is also a very dynamic process. Then we talked about the media and we found that cultural studies and media studies should not be conflated because cultural studies brought in a new, uh, new uh, aspect, okay, a new perspective in media studies. It is not that media studies was not there uh, before cultural studies. On the other hand, cultural studies comes in and gives a semiological aspect and when because it talks about the politics of the sign and it sees media all media forms as texts, all media processes as practices and uh, 
uh, cultural studies begins to talk about how meaning is generated in this media, uh, you know, products be they books, be these television, uh, you know, programs, etc. Right. And secondly, there was identity based media criticism and the study of media representation. Then one um, lecture was devoted solely to television as you know, in a bit to talk about one form of to focus on one form of media and he found that cultural studies, uh, you know, um, cultural studies exploration of uh, television um, brought in more textual analysis okay, and importantly audience research. Okay. It again one of the driving forces was that uh, you know we do not look at audience as simply passive consumers, we look at audience as uh, also contributing new meanings right and of course the the uh, the identification of new patterns of meaning and the political economy of television these are the things that cultural studies have made uh, or have fortified in an already existing media studies domain then uh, we we talked about new media as uh, you know a postmodern industry and we dis differentiated new media um, as you know um, where uh, from mass media by saying that mass uh, you know it, it mass it, it mass media may be in digital form but once but if it is not uh, exhibited and distributed um, then it uh, through the electronic uh, medium then it cannot be called new media and then um, we talked about cyber culture the key issues in cyber culture were identified as as always identity and subjectivity, race and class, materiality, techno capitalism, the digital divide etcetera. Then we talked about cultural policy and we, dis, and we cultural policy was seen as uh, you know the regulation and management and the administration of cultural forms and that they were institutions and government bodies and for instance museums and art and culture councils that were uh, you know at the helm of affairs and we also saw through critics like Tony Bennett that you know there was a there was a great need of cultural studies um, uh, you know scholars and academicians to contribute to cultural policy to you know guide cultural policy making and this divide between policy what you call the policy um, you know uh, the criticism policy debate polarity was to be broken and more and more academicians need to come in in the formulation on in helping the government to form cultural policies right. Then we also saw, uh, you know, uh, and we also did the recap on anti-positive, you know, cultural studies being targeted by many as a discipline that is uh, in that doesn't have clear answers. And we found that the, these were main in the main uh, those who uh, who could not uh, sort of um, could not accept the uncertain. The whole the fact that cultural studies itself is an you know is imbued with uncertainty, provisionality, and indeterminacy, and these are the virtues of cultural studies, as we argued in the end. And it was also seen as uh, you know if you're not careful, then it may definitely it may you know uh, instantiate, reinstantiate uh, dominant ideologies. And in giving too much importance to audience and audience resistance, it may give a lopsided um, you know power to consumer sovereignty. Okay. So, this was um, a brief summing up uh, of you know uh, all the modules or in this uh, in uh, you know in this course in this video course uh, on cultural studies. I may have just missed out one or two lectures, but in the main this is uh, what we have seen that we have done in our you know in um, uh, these uh, lectures on various aspects of cultural studies and uh, I would in the end like to bring back to you one of the formulations given by Stuart Hall right and would like to end with this really the, the signification representation and ideology is the essay and therein we, we talked about this uh, you know in one of our lectures I think in the first lecture if I am not mistaken and I am bringing it back to here uh, to you here and he says social relations do exist we are born into them they exist independently of our will, they are real in their structure and tendency. Social relations exist independent of mind, independent of thought and yet they can only be conceptualized in thought in the head. Okay. Uh, this really is one of you know the ways in which you can defend cultural studies. Cultural studies like as Hall says never says that there is no you know reality or at least there is no real arena in which things happen it does not 
uh, you know, it does not uh, contest also the fact that you know there are cultural forms are tangible that the body is real for instance it is made of flesh and blood and that there are there are these uh, you know modes of production that ultimately determine the way of life we lead but as hall says right one when one has to conceptualize these things then one has to write it out and talk about it in a certain way right and the way of talking of cultural studies happens, it happens in thought as he says it happens in the head. Now, this is you know uh, the para this is what some many find the paradox or these have something tangible, but then it becomes you know textual. The point is you it happens to a huge extent in language in discourse right and we have to understand that in talking about these things. Okay, issues of power, issues of representa representation feed back into the very reality of things, feed back into the whole even the tangible aspect, the materiality of things. So much that the material is also textual, right. So, if you understand this and you will have to understand that the business of cultural studies is different from the business of other domains, right. And one therefore, as long as you have this judicious balance between the text and it is and the production process the political economy of the text you cannot go wrong in cultural studies right. So, finally, let me leave you with these words by um, the person who was perhaps the greatest of all philosophers okay, that is Socrates and this is what we began you know uh, our lectures with and I am going to leave you with his words. The unexamined life is not worth living, thank you so much.